pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray right now that your spirit will be here with us and teach us. May we know that you are there and that the message is what you have given this church, this movement. May we hear from you and not from man. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good the midnight cry I love to echo still that cry Behold the heavenly bridegroom's night If the public will countenance such a quack pretender in his efforts to excite the minds of ignorant, superstitious people, they, as well as he, should bear the responsibility. The Republican Herald. We must speak out, and we will. These men are the worst enemies of God. The Olive Branch. The Second Advent delusion has proved the greatest calamity that has befallen us since our organization. General Convention of Baptists, 1846. When I look back to the period when we began to publish the news of a coming Savior, I think it the happiest time of my life. The glorious appearing of Christ is my only hope. To this I cling. William Miller On the 22nd of October in 1844, as tradition has it, a group of people stood or sat expectantly from morning to night on a large rock ledge in a place then called Low Hampton, New York. Nearby in the front room of a farmhouse, a 62-year-old itinerant Baptist preacher sat reading a Bible and praying. These people, and perhaps hundreds of thousands more, from Portland, Maine to St. Louis to Washington, D.C., were called Millerites. Some had sold or given away all their possessions in the preceding days. Others had left crops standing in the field. They had eaten what they thought was their last meal on earth. They and William Miller, the man in the farmhouse, were waiting quietly for the end of the world. One sad morning, I guess we could turn off this mic here, one sad morning was the morning after October 22. We talk about October 22 being the disappointment. That wasn't a disappointment. October 23rd was. When they woke up, Jesus wasn't there. That was the sad morning. That was the beginning, though, of what would become the Adventist Church. On a farmhouse there in Port Gibson, New York, is this, I don't know if this is my fault or not. <laughs> it usually is. Uh, was a man named Hiram Metzen. Hiram Metzen, um, down in Port Gibson, if you know where that's at, it's just uh, outside of Rochester, New York, around the Finger Lakes of New York, south of Ontario, Lake, Lake Ontario. And uh, he was a Millerite follower looking for Jesus to come. And that morning when he didn't show up, he said that they had prayed and wept. He says, we wept until day dawn that uh, Jesus had not come. And that morning he'd got together with some of his friends there in his barn. Uh, O.R.L. Kreuzer, young school teacher, about 21, 22 years old. He was a protege of Hiram Edson as he was encouraging him, supporting him in his work. Uh, Dr. F.B., Frank B. Hahn, uh, another one of the group in the Millerites, were very uh, uh, important in that area because they were responsible for getting the word out to some 50,000 people. So very effective in the Millerite movement. But disappointed, and there in the barn they had a little prayer meeting, praying for God to give them the answers about what had happened that day on the 22nd, why Jesus had not showed up. And after that, <coughs> uh, that experience was very similar to the experience that the disciples experienced. Remember, they didn't know he was going away. 
in our Bibles, we have about three different places where Jesus tells them what he's going to do. And when he does it, they don't believe it. Because it just can't be. And when he died on the cross, to them, that was his defeat. And so when they were huddled together in that upper room, they weren't there for a prayer meeting or worship session. They were there because they were afraid. Their whole cause had failed. And they thought maybe they were next. They're on the road to Damascus. Jesus disguises an unknown wa uh, 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 traveler with him, speaks with these two disciples. And they had said that they had hoped he was the one who would come and redeem Israel. And it says, and besides, they said, today's the third day. See, they had remembered what he had said about coming back on the third day. And here it is. And defeat it was all for nothing, they thought. Well, we know the story of the two travelers on the road to Emmaus. And they got back to their place, and then Jesus broke the bread. They recognized something in what he did, and when he blessed the bread, and they realized it was Christ. And he disappeared. And they ran back to Jerusalem. Now, if you look at a map, it's about, I'm not quite sure if I remember it right, eight to ten miles back to Jerusalem. And when they went back, it was at sunset. So now it's dark. On a road with no street lights. On a road that was filled with rocks and stones and different things. And they could see the city off in the distance, the city lights. Because they made their way back. Because of the way the landscape was. And they went back to tell the news. And I think of my journey. Maybe you can think of your journey. When we run to that city, we, we know Jesus is at. To tell the news of his coming. They, like many of us, fall off the path. They find themselves off the road, maybe in the shrubs, tripping over stones. We find the same experience. But they got back on the road. They didn't let it stop them. They kept kept on moving back to the city. At disappointment, they were beginning to have hope that what they thought was a defeat turned out to be his greatest victory, an empty tomb. And this is what happened on the 23rd of October in 1844, that we thought it was over until Hiram Edson, after that prayer in the, in, in the barn that morning, he and his friend Kreuzer decided to go share the news of the Advent message and help to hold up and support those who were disappointed as they were. And so they decided to walk through the cornfield. Maybe not take the main road because they didn't want to be sneered at, you know, have people saying, well, I see you didn't go up today. But on their way passing through the cornfield, Kreuzer writes in his memoir some years later, and maybe he had stopped to pray, but he's, as he stopped in the field, Kreuzer passed him. And when he realized he had passed Edson, he looks back and asked him why he had stopped. And the reason why, Edson says, I was receiving the answer to this morning's prayer. Now, Edson didn't necessarily have a vision, but he had an epiphany. In his mind's eyes, he looked up, he saw the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies. It was in heaven, not on earth. Jesus was coming to it there in heaven, there to do a work before he would come back to get us. And this was the beginning of our understanding of what happened on that day. Jesus is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, there to perform a work before he comes back. This led to their six-month Bible study with he, Kreuzer, and Dr. Hahn, and they picked Kreuzer to write the article. And they published this article in their little paper they had called The Day Dawn. The Day Dawn had a circulation of about 300. It was their own little paper. In fact, we can find copies of other editions of this paper in the Adventist online archives, so we can go back and look at them. Unfortunately, this article, the first one, published around March of 45, had become lost, was no longer extant for years. And it was until the early 90s when Merlin Burt of uh, the Center for Adventist Research there at Andrews University had went out searching for it. 
And he went to the little towns around Port Gibson. He stopped there in the little town of Canandaigua, and there looked at their paper archives, their newspaper archives from that period. And on the back page of that newspaper, he saw the article. He was able to republish it in Andrews University Seminary Studies. If I remember the year right, it was 2006, I think it was number two. They produced two, two each year. And uh, I'm sorry if I'm doing this. <laughs> and so, but a year later, uh, with more study and things happening, they, they en and enlarged the article. And um, Mrs. Hiram Edson sold some silverware. And they financed a paper, a special edition of a, of a post-Millerite paper called the Day Star. Now the Day Star was known as the Western Midnight Cry during the Millerite movement, but afterwards it became known as the Day Star. It was edited in Cleveland, Ohio by a man named uh, Enoch Jacobs, and Jacobs was open to other people's ideas. It was kind of like uh, a forum that you would go to today online, and you have different views come in to one area. And so he was able to bring in different ideas. that They weren't always agreeing with each other. And so they had produced a special issue of the work by uh, Kreuzer and, and Hiram Metzen and, and Dr. Hahn, and a special extra under the, the, the title was called The Law of Moses. And that was the one we had for many years. That was our oldest uh, extent document dealing with what we call the Sanctuary Doctrine. It was, in essence, our ground zero until the new document was discovered in the early 90s. And uh, <clears throat> there, in that special, in February, hung between two of the paper's editions where Ellen White had, publi had published uh, her letters. He had published her letters that he had sent, she had sent to Enoch Jacobs. The first letter she sent wasn't intended to be published. And she was sharing some of her own experience from her first vision. But he had published it, and so she felt she needed to enlarge upon that and explain herself, and so she sent a second letter. And in between those two letters of hers that were published, the day star shines out. And it was through there that she says that she was able to recommend that, that Brother Kreuzer had light on the sanctuary and, and that would give an explanation on what happened, what our experience was. We see that in Words of the Little Flock on page 20. And so this was the beginnings, is that light began to dawn on what had happened that sad morning, on what it was that God was beginning to do in the people. It began with men like White, James White and Joseph Bates, as they began to understand that the three angels' messages of revelation that two of the angels had been preached during the Millerite movement. But the third angel had not. And so they were thinking, well, this must be the time of the third angel. And anybody who's been around the church for a long time know that we use the euphemism to refer to Adventism or our message as the third angel's message in general. Uh, specifically, though, it's the three angels' messages because they all have to go together. But we often refer to it simply as the third angel's message because we knew that the third angel hadn't yet flown. In our basic understanding, Joseph Bates, was this, const this construct of the three angels. One angel would fly and end, and after he ended, the second angel would go, and the third angel, and that the third angel, Bates had understood, flew until 1844, when afterwards it was the Sabbath truth that was being presented. Joseph Bates was the one who was really responsible for bringing it into what we call the little flock. And so it was through his, his work that the Sabbath was perpetuated. But James White had some other ideas. He had said, no, we're, we're in the time of the third angel's message, after 1844. And so he put a little bit different order on it. But it was through their understanding of the three angels that they weren't just in chronology, first, second, third, in their separate messages, but that they actually overlap. And that what we see is that the, as the first angel starts, the first angel will continue on to the end of time until Jesus comes. And somewhere along the line, the second angel starts and joins with the first angel. And the same with the third. So that all three finish at the second coming of Christ. 
This was what became the standard view of the Adventist understanding of the three angels' messages. Ellen White speaks that we can't give the other messages unless we start with the first. So we may be in the time of the third angel's message, but simply to walk up to a front door and knock on and say and, and preach the th third angel's message uh, isn't enough. You have to start with the first. I mean, how would it sound? Hi, I'm here to give you the third angel's message. Uh, uh, Sabbath is the seal of God, Sunday is the mark of the beast. How's that gonna work? You, know, you go try that and tell me how it works out. You know you gotta start back at the right place. And you have to lead them. So this was the beginning of our understanding of what God was leading us to do. The church would meet, I don't know, am I hitting dead zones? Is it me or is it a connection here? Uh, the church began to develop its understanding through various meetings. In about 1848 to about 1851, we had a series of conferences. We have about a record of six of them that we know of. We think and really know there were more that we don't have a record of. That various Millerites would join and come together and discuss ideas that were being brought up at the time. And in this, <coughs> we laid out what would become the foundational understanding of Adventism, the pillar doctrines. And these doctrines haven't changed. They've grown in understanding, but they remain the same. And they're easy to remember because we, they all start with the letter S. Or we may have because uh, if anything else that we're teaching or not teaching that you think is pillar doctrine, these are the pillar doctrines. You need to reconsider those other things. So uh, maybe the way the Okay. The, like I said, the conference took place across northwestern United States, northeastern United States, and they took place in various parts. You had here in, uh, for instance, Port Gibson area, and this was where the idea of the sanctuary came out. And this is where we begin to develop what we call the sanctuary doctrine. And uh, Joseph Bates is from New Bedford, Massachusetts. He was the one who really brought out the Sabbath and began to teach that. In fact, he took it to the meeting at Port Gibson is where uh, Edson and Hahn and the rest of them became uh, Sabbatarians. And then we have, of course, Lowhampton, New York, up in New York there, where William Miller came from, and it was a non sequentia. He was preaching the second coming of Christ, uh, the advent. And we have then spiritual gifts, Ellen White there in Portland. She was born in Gorham, Maine, but she was basically raised in Portland, Maine. And then we have James White, along with Joseph Bates, who brought into the church our understanding through the Con uh, Christian Connection Church, our understanding of what we call conditionalism. Or and these were the foundational doctrines. If you notice, it wasn't just in one region. This was developed across the whole region. God bringing people together as he brought the movement together to make us who we are. And he brought us together with the context of this last message, messages of Revelation 14. So let's go back to Revelation 14 and take a look at the three angels' messages there. The first angel's message is important to understand in that it really is the main message. The other two messages are really augmented with the first. They're kind of like parts of it. They hang with it. And so we have to keep the first angel's message in light for, for all three as we go through them. 
The first angel's message simply says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. So it preaches a message of salvation, number one. That's the first part of the message, a message of salvation. That hasn't changed. If you read at the end of Matthew, we're given the Great Commission to go give the news of Jesus Christ. That so if you're a Christian, that's your mission. Mission orders. But in the three angels' messages, it's in the context that's different. That's what makes us Adventists in the context of giving the gospel in the end times. Because right after he says, I saw heaven having the everlasting gospel. To, to who? Who is the gospel going to? To those who dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Remember, I've, I've stood up here and said before about 10 times in the book of Revelation, that phrase, those who dwell on the earth, is a representation or a phrase that on believers, those who dwell on the earth. You don't dwell on the earth. You might find that surprising. You might live on the earth, but our dwelling place is in heaven. Our dwelling place is with Jesus. Ephesians 2, 6 says, we sit in heavenly places, de facto, with Christ Jesus. That's our place. But those who dwell on the earth are the ones who need to receive the message. Where? Through every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Notice it's in four parts. The four cardinal points everywhere, every group. That's an interesting phrase. But Revelation is found about six times in the book of Revelation. And it's interesting that it's not repeated exactly the same way any of the we see it back at the angel there in um, chapter 10 the angel with the open scroll John's been remember he ate the scroll and it was bitter and the angel says look you've been prophesying but you've got to prophesy again he says to what many nations every nation kindred tongue and people and that kind of phraseology so this is us this is the first angel's message we're the ones who's given the mandate by the angel with the open scroll to give the gospel to the world. That's what we're called to do. And we see the effects of this back in chapter 5, the book of Revelation. And we see the, the, uh, the scene sets up where they have the scroll that's been sealed and no one was found to open it, remember? And John was upset and he wept and the angel says, don't weep, John, we found somebody. Who? Who do you find? Lion from the tribe of Judah. But when John hears a lion, he looks and sees what? Slain with seven horns and seven eyes. And he goes up and he takes the scroll from the right side of the Father so he can have his position on the right side of the throne. Jesus sits with the Father. And then they break out in a little song, a little hymn, a little anthem. And they praise Jesus for what he had done, for shedding his blood for every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. This idea is universal all through the book of Revelation and culminates our mission to give the gospel everywhere. We talk about missions, and you think you've got to go across the ocean, go somewhere else. But where does missions start? It starts right here. It's right across the street, right next door. And that's your mission field. Your mission field could be inside the Family members and people you have who don't know Christ, who need to know him. And maybe you can't speak it. They won't hear it from you. All you can do is live it. You know, they say, preach the gospel, and if you can't use words. You know, or they say, and that's what we've been called to do. <coughs> that's the first angel's message in giving the gospel to every nation, kindred, but right after it says it's in this context of fear God, give glory. Why? For the hour of his judgment has come. It's a message of salvation, a message of judgment. We think of judgment usually of doom and gloom. And I've said up here to you before, that this is a message. Remember back to I mean, I'm sorry, the of Revelation chapter 6. This thing, this thing's, what, you want me to pull that out? 
Oh, okay. Oh, it just came loose. <laughs> you can't say I can't walk around because that, that's like uh, putting a... Um, <laughs> Anyways, where was I? Chapter 6. Remember the angels had said for her out, the gospel's being eclipsed, and they cry out, Lord, how long until you judge? The judge, the souls of the, the people who've given their life for the cause. And they want to know, when are you going to judge God? This isn't a capricious judgment. This isn't saying because we were killed, we want you to go revenge our death and hurt other people. They want to see the restoration of justice. Because as the horses went out with the gospel, we saw the gospel was being eclipsed by the very people who were to give it. And they, they saw God's justice wasn't coming to fruition as it should. How long, O oh Lord, until you judge, was the question. That's in the first angel's message. When you and I have the opportunity to give the message to the world. That God's judgment has come. That God is restoring justice. That's good news. That God is acting. He's stepped upon the state of action. He's taken the world in hand. <coughs> Change all things. Store all things. That's good news. So the first angel's message in the context of this judgment, that God is restoring all things, putting things back the way it should be. It ends. It ends in what? The new earth and the new city. The way it was before sin entered. That's what he's doing. And then the third thing, worship. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, of the first angels is why God brought this movement into existence. And it's not just because of the message for the message's sake, but it's in context to what's going on in the book of Revelation when we read the story about chapter 13 where the beast system is taking the world by storm and the whole world follows after the false system. So when we preach that worship message, worship him who made, we're given the message of Elijah. Like the northern ten tribes who got carried away into uh, mixing Yahweh worship along with uh, Baal worship. We're like Elijah that's supposed to go to the world and now tell them we need to make a decision who we're going to worship. Baal or Yahweh. Who are you going to worship? That's the Elijah message. If you ever thought who Elijah was for the end times, remember Elijah's supposed to come? Malachi? You're Elijah. It's not a who, it's a what. It's a message. The essence of what we were called to do is to give that message. Now the other two hang in it. We see it here. The first is the gospel, salvation, and it hangs with the second message <coughs> to come out of her, my people. When we say Babylon has fallen, we don't call them out. If you read Revelation 18, those first verses, where it repeats the second angel's message, the voice comes from heaven that says, come out of her, my people. God calls people out of Babylon. That's not your job. Your job is to preach the gospel. Our job is to be there for people when they come out of Babylon so we can minister to them. God will call them out. So you don't need to worry about calling people out. God knows his own sheep. His sheep knows his voice. He'll call them out. But in the gospel, the gospel is very important. I wanted to touch on because I hear within Adventism the use of the word gospel. Going to different parts of the world and we say preaching the gospel. But really what we mean by that is we're going to go to a different part of the world and preach Adventist distinctive message. And we use the gospel, the word gospel, interchangeably with that. And I have a problem with that because to me, if anybody knows me, I'm a very gospel-centered person. And the gospel, when you use the word gospel with me, it's very specific.
Take me to 1 Corinthians. This is a good place probably to see that picture, among other places, but this is probably, I think, I think the best. Now, you know Paul's had... Here at the end, in verse chapter 15, beginning with verse 1, he says, he says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved. So you get that? I preach to you which you received, because it's where you stand, it's your foundation. He says, by which you are saved. Without the gospel, you're not saved. That's how important this is. By which you are saved, he says. Unless, of course, he says you believed in vain. Didn't really receive it. He says, verse 3, For I delivered to you at first importance what I also received. He didn't invent this. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The gospel is embodied here in Paul with the death of Jesus Christ. And I add with that his life, the life he lived, is the embodiment of the good news that we share with the world. How is it embodied in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ? It's embodied in his life that he lived perfectly, the life we haven't, the life that he credits to us, his death was our substitute. He died so we don't have to. His resurrection was our guarantee. Without a resurrection, we're still in our sins. It was in his life, death, and resurrection. I also like to think of his life as not just the life he lived, past tense, that is credited to us, but as in the resurrection, it's in the life that he lives. It's because he lives, we have assurance. It's because he lives, we know. So that's the gospel, as specific as you can be. Paul tells us there at the beginning of Corinthians there in chapter 2. Let me get it. It's one of my favorites. I'm determined, chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> one of my favorites. I don't, don't even have it underlined in this Bible. It's, it's interesting. I determined, he says, to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus Christ and him crucified. You get the picture. Because there are many of us who it's very important to preach truth. It's about the truth. I became an Adventist because of the truth. And that's not what that said here. He says, I know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, of course, Jesus said what? He said, I am the truth. So if you want the truth, the truth is not found in a list of doctrines. It's found in a person. Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. And so there we see in, the, in preaching the first message of salvation, when it comes to the second angel pre preaching, that first angel's message has to continue because it's the call out of Babylon. As the system falls apart, God's people coalesce and he's put us in that place to minister to them. That's what I said, the second angel doesn't, can't stand separate from the first. It has to be incorporated into it. We see here uh, uh, the reference to it. I put up Jeremiah 51, 11. And, and Jeremiah, this is the real Babylon back here. Let's go back here to Jeremiah and just see what he wrote. And this is the pictures that John is using when he writes about uh, the Babylon has fallen. Jeremiah 51 11. I thought it was 51 11. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Since my eyesight has blurred. 51 1. <clears throat> Uh, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm going to arouse against Babylon and against the inhabitants of Lebkameni, the spirit of a destroyer. I will dispatch foreigners to Babylon that they may winnow her 
It may devastate her land, for on every side will be opposed to her in the day of her calamity. Let not him who bends his bow bend it, nor let him raise up in his scale armor. So do not spare her young men. Devote all her army to destruction. This is God's uh, curse upon Babylon for what they've done to his people. In verse 6, flee from the midst of Babylon, and each of you save his life. Do not be destroyed in her punishment. And so this picture of a fallen Babylon in the end, Babylon becomes a symbol of God's enemy who holds God's people captive. God destroys it. But in its destruction, captives are set free. And that's what we're called to do, to give that message at the end there. Then this idea of worship. And the third angels, not to receive the mark of the beast. Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30 tell us what that mark is. And the mark is the Holy Spirit. You thought I was going to say the Sabbath, didn't you? Because we, we talked about the Sabbath being the sign of loyalty, right? But that's not the mark of God. The mark of God is his spirit. But when we read the verse in verse 7, worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the the water, we know that verse is a direct echo of Exodus 20, verse 11, the Sabbath commandment. We're worshiping Creator God, who rested on the seventh day. And so we know God's people by the loyalty to God, the fidelity to Creator God. And this sign of test of loyalty would be Sabbath. But remember, it's not about the day, but the person of the day, receiving His Holy Spirit. I also mentioned Deuteronomy chapter 6, um, beginning with verse 4, which is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Yeah. And it talks about binding God's laws upon our arms and the frontals of our eyes. We see this in the Jewish tefillin, or phylacteries, we call it. They put that little black box on their head, and that arm, and they're bowing to the wall and everything. And in the box is usually one of several texts, and usually it's the Shema or something like that. And they're binding God's law, his word, upon them. in their arm and their hand by what they do, and the frontals between their eyes by who you are on the inside person. You know. And we see this being used in the third angel's message with receiving the mark of the beast. You notice that for God's people who receive his seal, it's only in the forehead, the inner person. But for the beast system, it could be bound upon the head or the arm. You can feign it by what you do and not believe it, and that's okay with the beast system. I mean, isn't that what happened during Nazi Germany? I was just following orders. I didn't really believe it, but I was just going along with things to kind of keep myself from being caught up and thrown into a camp. But that's the same thing with the beast system. It doesn't matter whether you're committed to it or not, as long as you act like it. But God only has one seal on the forehead. In other words, total commitment. And that's the third angel's message. When we give the Elijah message of who are you going to worship, and it can't be feigned. You can't make that up. We saw that on Mount Carmel in 1 uh, Kings chapter 18, where he's on the mountain, and he says, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? How long are you going to hang out between two ideas about who God is? Baal or Yahweh, or Yahweh, as I've heard some say. So we're going to find out today, he says, who God is. That's your message, his Adventist. To help bring the world about to understand who God is, not this false system. We talk about spiritualism coming into the church these last five, six, seven years. We've seen more of this there. Uh, stuff coming in where we're talking about uh, spiritualism coming into the Adventist church. And Ellen White's written about that. We've known that was going to come along for a long time. Don't get caught up in the false ideas that are out there about this. There are false ideas that lead you into thinking you have the right idea about it. All it's going to do is throw up a bunch of smoke. You'll know. But the new age, what we call new age, what we call paganism, is affecting the whole world, and not just the Adventist church, but everywhere. So we need to ask the question, who are you going to worship? 
And that's what we're about, is we restore worship of Creator God. Those three things are paramount to our church. Worship is very important. In Revelation 13 and 14, which is kind of like a unit that tells what the beast system is doing to lead the world astray and what God is doing to restore all things, eight times the word worship is used. Of the eight times, only one time is it used in reference to Creator God. And that's in the first angel's message, verse 7 of 14, where it says, Worship him who made. Worship creator God, the one who made the heavens and the earth. That's the one we're to worship. That's part of your message. We have a movement that was raised up out of that disappointed day to give this very message at this time in world history. The sanctuary doctrine was very important to us because it puts us in place and time. After 1844, we know confidently where we are in salvation history. We know we are in the last days. And by knowing that, having that confidence of where we are in time, we know that it's time to give the three angels' messages. So we know we're not running ahead of the, ahead of the curve. We know that we're not running late. We know that we're running right on time. That's why the sanctuary doctrine is so important. It's where it puts us. It's not just in the matter of what Jesus is doing in the sanctuary, but where he has put us in time. He forged this movement out of that day of disappointment for this very thing. Hopefully, that's why you're Adventist. Not because of the Sabbath. Not because you agreed with the state of the dead or some other list of doctrines, but that you saw the message God rose this church up to give and said, yeah, I'd like to be part of that. Amen. And that's why you join with the movement, not just to come to church to sit in the pew. That's fine. I've done enough of my pew sitting. But he called us for more than that, Amen. to give this great message. That's what he called us for. This is the last message that will go to the earth. When you read Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the last message after is a picture of Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. There is nothing in between. That's the last message. You and I were called to give it. Like they said and sang back in the days uh, in the Millerite movement, we shall, you know, when shall I see Jesus? <coughs> That should be on our lips. We should be saying with John, even so, Lord Jesus, come. How many of us have put that off in our minds because we're afraid of it? Or we don't want to suffer tribulation? When we realize what it's really all about, we're able to say with John, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Because it's all about the restoration, Amen. about putting things right. Amen. And so that one sad morning has turned into one glad morning in the anticipation of the arrival of Jesus. That one morning when he comes. I would like to sing the song, One Glad Morning, <clears throat> but some of the theology in it's a little, not Adventist, but that's okay. I still like the song. And, uh, <clears throat> but that's, what started out in disappointment will take us into victory. What started out as the Christian movement in disappointment, when they were huddled in that upper room, has led into victory. When we realize that what we thought was his defeat was his greatest victory. When we thought that was our greatest disappointment, that October 22nd, we realize it was the birth of a great movement to give a great message at this time in salvation history to see the face of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the uh, opportunity that we can be in the vineyard to give this great message at this time in their history, to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to everywhere we go, that we can share this idea. Jesus is coming again, restoring all things, and that he has accomplished your salvation upon the cross of Calvary, and that he wants you in that new kingdom. We're not talking about who we can exclude. We're out to find people we can include. Bless us with that mission. Give us that courage 
and that, and that zeal to go forth with it, to share the good news of not just what you've done for us, but what you have done and will do for others who are out there looking for the peace of Jesus as well. Bless us as we go from here with that idea is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.